before I go on to do what I do for the next 15 minutes today, I'm going to put up a little picture on the screen. And uh, I ask of you to look at that picture and pin a feeling to that face. Some people say frustration, some people say sadness, some anxiety. There's a lot of heaviness in her face. Those eyes do communicate something that's sad. These are the feedbacks that I get. We, people who know me know that I work with children with disabilities. They work, I work with children with risk. And they also come out with, um, you know, saying that that's a child with a disability. You've only shown her face. The rest of the picture is not visible. So it must be a child with some kind of a problem. I'm hoping that you've actually pinned that word onto that face and that emotion on that face. I want you to look at the context of this real picture. This is Parimala. Parimala is a 13-year-old girl who fell out of school, a well-performing child who fell out of school to take care of her brother. Obviously, that's a child with a disability. As a development worker, I'm often asked to find a solution to a problem like that. Fix that problem is what they tell me. And if I would ask all of you sitting here, how would you fix a problem? How do you fix this problem? I'd get answers like, send the child to special school, send the child to school, and then Parimala can go to school. We've become this community that actually works towards fixing problems. And how do we fix them? We work solutions that segregate them. Where are our sick? Where are the old? Where are the dying? Where are the disabled? Where are the orphaned? We create spaces away from mainframe society, away from the moving parts of the society. We sort of have very conveniently segregated them into spaces. Our orphans are in orphanages. We put a board up there and say orphanages. We put our sick in the hospitals. We take our dying to hospice. And we take our disabled children to special schools. We've taken them to the periphery of our lives. And on my work, I'm asked often to find solutions. And that's what I'm going to sort of dwell with. At the Fourth Way Foundation, what we do is work on social problems and find solutions to it. And of the 15 years that I've been working with Fourth Way Foundation and the development sector, we've actually come up with a little community tool to an audience because we were still piloting it. We thought we were never ready with something like that. And the tool that I'm going to sort of take you through will be a kind of a formula to involve a community in solving its problems. It's something that we've done successfully ac across two, three geographies, large demographies. We've actually done systemic change. We've done systematic we have sustainable, replicable, scalable stuff with this just one tool. And this is how it looks. It's a simple formula. It's called look before you lead. It's a process. It's scientific in approach. It is heavy when you actually get down to the basics of how to execute it. But Having to make this simple, I'm going to take you through an experience of one of my largest projects called Nanagushale. Nanagushale works with children with disabilities. And Parimal, like you see, is just one story that I work with. Obviously, the reason that I do what I do is because of lives like this. Parimala has fallen out of school because of her brother who has, who's disabled or has a disability. What we do, what we do at the Fourth Way Foundation is to look at that problem. Oftentimes, we're taught to look at a problem and fix the problem. And when we try to fix the problem, all we do is find an immediate solution with the limit, limited understanding that we have, the limited experience and knowledge that we have, and that's problem fixing. The educational system has done exactly just that to us. We only fix problems. It's a flaw in our uh, upbringing in the schools and colleges. Simply to take, go back to Parimala's story, Parimala is one child who is taking care of her brother in a little village. I'm going to show you in numbers what this is going to pan out in scale and what it's going to look like as an economic social burden. 
In a village where Parimala lives, there are three to four children with disabilities. If I were to take it to the, a taluka, a taluka has around 50 children with disabilities. Take it to the district, we're talking about 500 children with disabilities. Talk about the state of Karnataka, we're looking at easily six lakh old children just between the ages of six and 18 who are children with disabilities. This is a reality. Disability is a reality like many other problems we face in our country. And how do we fix the problem? Send them to special schools. N number of special schools are not going to solve this problem at all. Has the state done well? Yes, it is all enshrined in the RTE, the right to education. It's all there. It's a problem with our nation is to execute something to the last mile. We, we are not very good at delivering the last leg of the story. Otherwise, we have everything the best in the place. I see people nodding their heads. Yes, we are very proud as a nation for having a lot of stuff in place. Our failure is in the execution of the last mile. What do we do? We looked at the problem and we looked at the problem differently. The problem is often seen in Parimala's case as the child with a disability is the problem, so let's fix that. How do we look at fourth wave and turn this problem around? It's not the child who is the problem here, it's the system who failed that child in including that child into a normal society is the problem. That's how we look at a solution. It's not fixing a problem, but defining a solution. And with solving just one Parimala's case, we were actually set out to solve a problem with the state was facing. The state was actually shutting down a program called the Inclusive Education Program, Integrated Education Program. And we just started with one story in a little village, and this is how we took it. So look, we did. We looked at it differently. It's not the problem of the child or the problem of the child with disability, but it's a problem of a system that failed to bring the child into the mainstream. We do something before we execute. Look before you lead. And before we actually set out creating change, I've seen people just go out, okay, we found a solution, let's execute it. But I think there is a science behind actually looking at all the moving parts in a society that's responsible in bringing a change. And that's what we do at Fourth Wave. The second secret is to apply the 70-30 rule before you start any intervention. And seriously, over all the 15 years of working community, starting from a panchayat to the entire state missionary, we understand that 70% of the change that you want to implement is already existing in a community. As stakeholders who are responsible of it, the parents, the teachers, the caretakers of a child with disability, we have five departments who have a mandate around working with children with disability. But they're all working in isolation. They don't come together at a table. We have huge giants in the disability sector who work in isolation. Now, what are we doing with the 30%? The 30% is us. That's the Fourth Way Foundation or anybody here who wants to bring about the change. The 30% rule is that every time you look at a problem and you're wanting to look at a solution, you should have enough of a 30% to come to the table with to say, okay, let's execute change. And what does 30% look like when we started off 15 years ago? People looked at us and said, oh, they're a bunch of youngsters, a lot of ambition, they're not going to do what they say, they don't have the knowledge of disability in them, they've not even seen a child with disability, they have never dealt dealing a child with disability, and they're talking inclusion. Let's see how far the story goes. They looked at us and said, okay, this is an organization, it has no assets, it has no offices, they're all virtually functioning, it's just a bunch of newbies who has a lot of energy, and they want to implement at scale. They looked at us and said, okay, they don't have designations also because nobody's a special teacher, nobody is uh, anybody from the sector who's dealt with uh, disabilities, they're all catalysts. That's what we call ourselves, from the CEO of this firm that I work with to the person at the grassroots, the legs doing the job, we are called catalysts. What did we do? We brought 30% to the table. How did we do it? Finding the use in society. Look before you lead. We knew we had a vision to achieve. That was to bring children with disabilities into the normal mainstream schools at scale, not one or two. So how do we do it? We look for the people in the community who can bring about the change. And in Parimala's case, we wanted the child to go to school. We approached the um, local panchayat, they had no solutions. We went about asking who can get the child to school because the school was ready. The school was ready to accept, the system was ready to take the child in, but there was a practical problem of actually ferrying this child to school. Somebody had to physically carry the child into a classroom. 
Who would do that? Parimala can't do it. Through the day, she can't be carrying the child around. Parents can't do it because they are people who have to go to the fields to get their bread. How do we solve it? We went around the community asking if it was possible. We met auto unions, and then they came forward and said, let's do it. One of us will ferry the child to the school every day. They did it for a year, and then they realized it's not only just one child, but there are four children. Now, it's become a very economical thing to do. All of them take turns. They get paid by the panchayat to take the child to the school, and then now the child is in school and Parimala is in school. It is said that for every child with a disability, there is a sibling that falls out of school. I'm talking about six and a half children in the state of Karnataka between the age groups of six and 80. And we're talking about one sibling each. We're talking about 12 lakh children who will fall out of the schooling system and at some point become an economical burden because they are not contributing the, to the society. They are actually not part of a society that's included them or shown them a process of being part of it. This is what we did by finding the use in the society. And this is how we lead. We're often taught in schools and colleges to lead from the front and lead such that you are an example. I think the leadership the country reads right now, from grassroots up to the nation, national level leadership, is to lead together. And this has immense power. I think you can sell a product of a shelf showing all its advantages and goodness, but how do you sell goodness in itself? How do you tell people that you know, in doing good there is power? You do it. And I think all of us have that innate goodness in all of us that we recognize. That's why we're all sitting in a hall like this. We just know when somebody is courageous, standing at, on ethical grounds, somebody who has high integrity, nobody needs to market that. It's visible because all of us have something as a common thread that binds us together as community. And I think this is how we lead. I have not gone to the uh, details or the science of how this is being implemented, but this little formula of look before you lead actually works. Now, I can talk, the all, talk all day, but you'll ask me, what are your numbers? Show me what you've done. What is the change that you've created? When we started eight years ago with the program Nanugushale, our only mission was to ensure that enrollment in government schools for children with disabilities becomes a reality. Then, children like Parimala can also go to school. We're not only looking at the child with a disability, we're looking at a system that failed the child with picked up five districts, we worked for three years, we identified people who had disabled themselves but mobile, who've done small incredible things at the village panchayat level to start going door to door and telling people that your child has a basic right of being in the school because they didn't know it. They thought children with disabilities didn't belong to the school. And that's all we did. Did we put people on the ground? We put people on the ground. What, what kind of people? The people from the community. And that's why we are an organization without great overheads. Because we've learned to actually implement a solution with the power of the people at the grassroots. And what did we do? In three years, we included 8,000 children, 8,000 odd children into the government system. Suddenly, the government sat up and said, oh, something's happening. And now they're doing something. So they asked us to come forward and take another five districts and try and implement this again. Similar numbers popped up. And in six years, we moved the trajectory for enrollment from 1%, that's the traditional 1% of enrollments that happened in the first standard, to 21% in the state in 10 districts. How did it happen? It's just because people stood up to help other people. These stories go unnoticed because it's happening at very grassroots levels, but they are the local heroes, and those are the people that make change possible. And this is a secret formula for all of you, that we engage people who face the problem, make them understand they are stakeholders of the problem, and help them, give them the power to lead. And we've done it very successfully. Now, to uh, the cherry on the cake is when the government calls this insignificant bunch of youngies who think they can bring about a change to the table to discuss on how we can actually roll this out across the states, across the departments, and they ask us to look at it, at what is the shortcoming in all of it. We do the research, we hand it over with suggestions and recommendations, and today it's a state-run program, an effectively run program. <laughs> what did we do? We simply applied this formula. It's very powerful. We are very powerful as a nation. Our instruments are very strong, very networked. It's just that one or two who need to stand and get it implemented. Okay, I understand one area, disability, 
uh, Karnataka, yes. Now show me how this works in another setup. So we took a very challenging step three years ago. We moved to the next state, the state of Kerala. Completely different demography, completely different set of people and problems to handle, completely a set of people who are highly literate and have a say in everything. And we had to solve a bigger issue. A bigger issue was this. The biggest problem of the rise of use of narcotics and substance abuse. The state had tried a lot, people complain, go to the police, the mafia is so strong, numbers are increasing, just in one year it's doubled. The, this is just registered cases. This is a looming large problem. It is a problem to solve, it is something that we really want to do, but how did we do it? We looked at the problem, and like always, we looked at it very hard. You can remove alcohol, you can remove anything as substance from the market, and you'll still see people getting hooked on. So what did we do? We looked at the problem and they said, okay, there is a generation of youngsters who have to take responsibility. They have to take ownership, and the problem lies with them making choices for the future for themselves. And now we wrote one of the largest programs in the state of Kerala on teaching kids how to say no. Now we are to teach them to make the right choices. And we teach them how to say no. And we work with the missionaries. We, like before uh, we do anything, 70-30 rule applies. We work with the government. We work at all levels. We work with people at the grassroots. And we've been able to implement something. We've picked up the youth in the community who will actually champion this. Young volunteers who go and speak the language and talk the language. And then suddenly the kids look up and say, if they've done it, we can do it. I'll have youngsters looking at me now and asking, yeah, but we don't belong to a community anymore. We're a floating population. We're a city. We're urbanizing. We don't belong to a space and time. What do we do? How do we take ownership of problems? I think, as much as all is said, we are also going to be a generation that's going to stay in the largest gray space. The gray means we don't know what is good and bad anymore. We don't know what is right and wrong. We don't know what is white and black. We don't know how to say yes or no. And that largest gray space is very tough. And all us youngsters sitting here, all of you will be challenged with this problem. And how are you going to be working as a community? I think the secret lies again in look before you lead. I think all of us have to look at the problem and look at the advantages that we have. I think we're a community today where travel will shrink. We'll only travel for fun. We'll only travel for the uh, goodness of traveling and seeing places. Work and all other travel will reduce. We'll be, I think, a generation that lives in pods. All our high rises, like we just heard, is, is nothing. We don't need that much of a space. All of us can live in pods and trees in the future. We'll have common shared kitchens, but we will live in our own spaces for our privacy. I think we'll live in a future where bioengineering will become one of those in things. Uh, organ donation will become a normal thing. I think solutions lie in the future for us, and the, f the youngsters of today have a great, great opportunity lying. It's just that we are trained now to only feed our own cars, our own houses, and you know, live in an economy which is so self-centered. But look at the globe. You are a global community now. You cannot refuse it. India is moving and leading in that direction. And I think we'll have great pioneers. If somebody as insignificant as me and a bunch of youngies or my teammates think we can create solutions that are scalable, that are replicable, that can be actually implemented as a you know, systemic change, can do something like this. We have immense power lying here immense power in the youngsters, and immense power for the future. And I'd like to just close with one slide. The problem is not how to wipe out the differences, but how to unite with the differences intact. Our solutions lie there. Our beauty lies in our diversity. Our beauty lies in the uniqueness of all, all of us are made. But I think there's this common thread of goodness that everybody will recognize. Thank you for being a patient audience. Thank you for listening to me. Thanks. <laughs>